Howard Lindzen is the founder and general partner at Social Leverage. All opinions expressed by Howard and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Social Leverage or StockTwits. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. Guests may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. Hi, I'm Howard Lindzen and I'm Manscaped. And this is one of our portfolio companies, Manscaped. But today on the show, uh, my partner Gary Bennett, a uh, longtime uh, entrepreneur in the enterprise customer support space, uh, and I rarely get a chance to sit down with him and especially do this podcast and talk about investing and uh, the future. Gary. Howard. Not Gary B, Gary B. That's Welcome right. to the pod. Thank you. This is Gary Bennett. How old are you? 44. I don't think when, I mean, this is audio, so I think the, the rule of, of video is don't wear a polka dot oh, shirt. Man, so this could, be, this could all be blended together. But you're, you know, you're learning. Yeah. So you're on the pod, Gary Bennett, good tan, because you live where? San Diego. What part of San Diego? Del Mar. So Gary, uh, we have some great stories and VC insights and investing insights to share. Gary is my partner, third pod in the tripod that is social leverage. We have a pretty good origin story that we'll get into together. Um, but first, why VC? Uh, you know, I'm going to get into your background, but why VC? Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, it started for me by angel investing, right? So uh, actually going back before that, I was- And an by angel investing, your own money. My own money, yeah. But uh, before that, I was an entrepreneur, so I, I was at the other side of the table and uh, helped start a few companies. And uh, along the way, had some capital to invest and some great relationships with within the founder community. And uh, I want to see founders succeed, and I also want to be part of that ecosystem. And so I started angel investing. What year? Um, really in 2011. Was it with uh, money you could risk or was it risky money? No, it's money I could risk. Okay. It's money that I could risk. Check size um, but was I would 25K? Say, I would say as an angel, I had different motivations than I do as a VC. So yeah. it was more about learning and the experience and truly being p- part of the founder journey. And it wasn't really about making money. Certainly, I had an expectation not to lose money, but it was more about um, being in the flow and having that experience. At a San Diego first angel or New York? At a San Diego first investments. Um, and then mostly out of San Francisco. Okay. So <clears throat> just just quickly, um, you joined Social Leverage. December 2014. 2014. So we, were, we together have invested uh, $20 million together in Fund 2. And now we've just closed $45 million. Don't know if it's legal or not. <laughs> but uh, Fund 3, we're investing out of Fund 3. So That's we've right. been we've inv- invested together for five years, but we've known each other longer. So I'm going to quickly give uh, our origin story, uh, mainly because uh, I'm waiting for your Adderall to kick in. <laughs> just you know how trusting you are. You're the first. I, I have told people I trust what's in you, here. no problem. I have a lot of, of meds. Course. And uh, I steal them from my son. So it's it's kind of reverse. Whose name's on millennial. that label? I can't read this. <laughs> the font is like Twitter at this point. Uh, so but you, you, you're clean as a whistle. You don't take anything. You're soylent and fasting. I mostly. used to be soylent. No more. <laughs> we'll dive into that too. But you're very trusting. Gary is as clean as they come. Uh, he lives in the future, uh, both software product, people, and food. I think you live in the future with so. food and diet, which is impressive. Uh, so you are, you're not a millennial. You're what, what generation are you? Or Gen you X, are? is that the you're one? Gen X? Yeah. So you're tailing end of Gen X. So, I, I, I mean, so, so comfortable taking risks around living in the future, which, you know, is fun for me to watch. I make fun of them a lot. But, I mean, so trusting. And, and, and I think what makes you a great BC is you, do, you trust the right people. Uh, you take risk. Uh, this could have been an amb- You know it that I take been. Ambien. Yes. And uh, you know I also this occasionally would be a, take five milligrams of, they call it Adderall, a, but it's Ritalin. This would a great show if that was the case. Well, I want to have my show <laughs> where I give them, and they don't know if they're getting an Ambien or Ritalin, 30 minutes Blue in. If they're sleeping, 
They took the Ambien. Right. So, but you, I gave Ritalin. So you've never taken Ritalin no, before. No. So for me, Ritalin is fantastic. I remember, even though I'm off key, off already, <laughs> off on a tangent. <laughs> uh, that you know, I hit this age, and I think you'll hit it in six, seven years. Hopefully not. Um, I can't explain why. Uh, where all I do is manscape <laughs> and think about, oh, I need energy. Uh, and so five milligrams, you know, I was in with my son and we were talking about he needs, you know, high dosage. He doesn't take it, but he needs high dosage to, to function in school, to concentrate. He has very low RAM, I would call it, meaning he loves life. He listens. Doesn't matter how much he listens, you know. The RAM isn't there. And so, you know, one day we're talking about why he doesn't take drugs. And, and the doctor looked at me. She goes, you know, you. <laughs> she, saw, she diagnosed me and his me. And he said, you should try this. And I said, I don't want any more drugs. And she said, you know, she went through why she thought it could help me. And sure enough, you know, a couple years later, five milligrams here yep. and there. So you just took your first <clears throat> Well, I've five seen you in meetings, so I know it works for you. Okay, good point. So, so. So where we met, I was living in Phoenix. I started StockTwits in Phoenix. And my investor in StockTwits, Tony Conrad, told him I'm moving to Coronado. Tony said, oh, you got to meet uh, Gary Bennett and Alex Bard, who are great entrepreneurs. Uh, keep an eye on them. They're in San Diego. I think that's how I met. How did you know True Ventures? So we, we were introduced to Tony because uh, we had both been at AOL. Um, yes. So I think that was the connection, and um, I don't know. Right around the same time that we were meeting you, we were hitting True up for an investment. I think okay. into our last company, which you and Tom in invested in as so well. So maybe they had already committed, or you know, I don't sure. really remember. Yeah, Actually, okay. the way I tell the story, um, I saw that you were moving to Coronado because Twitter was a thing, and you yeah. were out there. And you know the San Diego community isn't all that large, so when someone like you moves to town, uh, there's there's a desire to get together and, and 2010? meet. 2009 ish. Wow. 2009. Okay, yeah, right yeah. when I moved. Okay, yeah. so so you see so that I'm moving. So I think that uh, I think we actually reached out, and maybe at the same time Tony connected us. Um, so I don't really remember the, the exact yeah. So So events. I'm moving. I'm just picking up my life after the crash here in 2008. I'm taking the family like the hillbillies to Coronado. Uh, we're not looking for oil. We're just looking for uh, not real estate and a community that's not uh, blown up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we get an interview. We hit it off. I, see, yeah. I sit down with you. I don't meet your other product. I meet you and Alex. We hit it off. Tom and I write a check into what then was a Sicily. Correct. So let's talk quickly about a Sicily and customer support because this is, this is basically our life together. You were starting a Sicily. What was a Sicily? Yeah, I was starting a Sicily. It was my third entry into customer service and support. I had done it two other times, once in New York and once in San Diego. Um, both of the prior companies were more enterprise focused and this was more SMB focused um, because of our prior company, which was a consumer product company. And so we wanted to sell a product where people could deploy it immediately, they could see the benefit of it quickly, and the user, we could get immediate feedback. So it had to be effectively a SaaS application that was very easy to set up. And at the time, 2009, 2010, uh, Twitter and Facebook were starting to become used for, for, so, for customer, customer service. Support. And um, we felt that a platform that was SMB focused, but also with a social, uh, social channels built into it from the start would actually be really beneficial Which for that segment. Which is right in segment. our wheelhouse, even though right we we're, we're not, we, at the time we were not enterprise investors, but. We got a couple of investments in that space. Yeah. yeah. So, so we get your pitch, we invest. How much did you raise? Uh, we raised 1.7. At that time, that was a Series A. <laughs> <coughs> 1. So 1.7. Oh, the good old days of 2010. <laughs> right. So, so it was a Series A? It was, it was a Series A. It was labeled a Series A. Had but you obviously raised some No, that was our first money in. Okay, so you didn't go seed. You went straight to A because you were mature entrepreneurs. Yes. And it was led by True? It was led by True, and you guys were the only other investors. We put 100K in for us. This was before even our first fund. That was a big check. That's right. So, so for us, obviously, and I didn't take notes, I... Uh, but I would think if we wrote a 100K personal check back then, Tom and I, that's a big check. So yeah, we liked it was a good you, valuation. And we <laughs> loved that business. <laughs> right. I don't know if the valuation was that good. What was the valuation? For you? I mean, it's $4 million pre? Come on. 
Yeah. That is good. Yeah. So I mean, th- we were fourth time were entrepreneurs. <laughs> was it a we were thinking it was coming out of 2008, 2009. There weren't a lot of people writing checks. and uh, That was a good deal. Yeah, Just to I get was four great entrepreneurs at one company. That's right. So, so, I, so message to we're cheap. <laughs> Social leverage <laughs> itself right. is cheap. And now you have a little insight to why, That's even right. though Gary himself lives like a rock star and invests like a wild man, takes more <laughs> risks than me. I think we're entitled to be cheap. We I think lived so. we yeah. lived through a crash and four million dollar a rounds, and you guys had a product. It may not have been complete. We Was had a product, product, so we self funded it. We founded the company in October of two thousand nine, and we self funded dot com assistly assist dot ly to begin with. Right, because Libya uh, was the place. Uh-huh. <laughs> was it Liberia or Libya? Uh, Libya. Okay, and. Uh, yeah, I think maybe we had a Sicily.com at the same time, but LYs were cool. Okay. Bitly and and I don't and, know, and I think what made it hard for you to f- we can talk about this four founders. Yeah, I don't know that that made it hard, but it it, it was somewhat more difficult equal? because one we were equal, which so, I wouldn't so recommend. I, to I folks. think VCs frown on that. Yes, except like a true who was like kind of a they frowned cavalier. on it too, but they understood that we were experienced and that mm-hmm. we had gone through the journey before and they appreciated it although there was some some conversations around that yeah um the other thing that made it somewhat challenging is that two of us were on the west coast and two of us were on the east coast mm-hmm. and so it's just hard to build a business when your management unbelievable team isn't together. I, you know in hindsight i don't know but i w- let's give some advice to people i don't think you pitched it as four founders no we did for sure. You did. So obviously I, I don't listen. So nothing's changed. <laughs> but, but we were I the wasn't business scared guys. And you because just, I had already yeah. crushed it with Buddy Media. It was husband and wife. And back then yeah. you weren't supposed to invest. You know, Mike and Cass were like, voodoo. Yeah. Don't do husband and right. wife teams. Uh, well, they broke that rule. Yeah. And, that's the, and I don't that's believe the exception. in exception. There's a few of those exceptions. But and I don't even know if they're exceptions. It's just the people. Yep. We're investing in people. Is there any tips? that So did people pass on you because of, of you were four? Um, I don't know that they passed because we were four. I think they passed because um, we were not together, for sure. Uh, you know, big distances between us. At the time, Alex and I were living in San Diego, and it wasn't immediately clear where we would start the company out of. We ultimately decided to build it out of San Francisco, and Alex was, and I that commuted. Was weather, that was a huge, huge – we didn't – I'm clueless. I'm living in Coronado. I'm like, why are you idiots moving? And right. <laughs> on your own, you were like – well, the business is in San yeah. Francisco. I mean, what I we mean, realize is that all of our customers... Lucky we found founders like you. All of our customers were within a two-block radius. I understand. But I take my VC money and I moved to Coronado. I, I understand. <laughs> so, and my VCs didn't stop me because my thing was, listen, you know, and, and I think maybe they should have. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I can attract talent well, when, wherever, when you, and I'm looking for lifestyle, and I can build some, you know, uh, social network. The proof is I can build it from Coronado. I think it was, yeah. I think it was, I, I think I undermined myself not knowing. I think right. I could have gotten better advice about like what I was going to face. I didn't give you this advice. So right. what did the what, VC- well before you go there? What, when you were building Wall Street, where did you where did you do oh, that? Oh, I was living in New York. You were basically. living in New York, and that was a very quick run right it was well like, i wasn't living there but like Lindsay you, and the yeah. team were in new york and i had to be there but you so were actually living in two Phoenix weeks a month and yes. you were mostly but, there yeah and so we came to the same realization that we could build a big business in san diego but if we want to build it bigger faster i think more it, made efficiently, it made a big difference now you had to live in an apartment yeah. and like do a lot of try i mean you guys had the grind you had the four million valuation you gave yet so let's do the math here quickly because this is not this is not we don't advise this to other startups because we would frown on other startups that come to us and say, I'm starting with 25% of the company. Right. Uh, there's a four chance way of divorce. That's right. Uh, we're not living in a major city yeah. and trust us. And we're giving up 40% of the company? No, to that first round? Yeah. Yeah. So you 30, were already under 30 20%. Something percent yeah, for sure. We start. That yeah. deal doesn't get done today. I think the the exception to the rule again is that um, three of us had known each other since seventh or eighth grade, uh, lifelong friends. This was our fourth startup. Uh, if you count all four of us, we had known each other for eighteen years plus. Yeah, I remember. So it's um, and by the way, we had deep domain. This was our third company in the space. Yes. So uh, I think the deal does get done. I think uh, well, it deal got gets done. done because at that valuation, yeah, you th- hold your nose and go fuck. Yeah. These are great guys. That's right. Hopefully they get along but the math wasn't great for you 
unless you get it, a massive well, exit. so we believed that we were building a, a huge company and so really the numbers you know the numbers at a 10 million dollar exit no they don't make sense but if you believe that you're building something that's going to be uh, significant in the world and that you're going to have a large outcome then your percentage ownership of it doesn't matter as much as how big the overall piece is yeah and we'll get to the final story where you sell to salesforce and and live happily ever after in your <laughs> Tesla drinking Soylent, taking Adderall from strangers. But call you uh, a stranger. next step is um, you call me and you say, we're moving to San Francisco. I'm like, yeah. thank you. I said thank you. Yep. Because uh, no one wants to live you in San Francisco. You can't take a couple board meetings. Everybody too. lies and says they like to live there. But listen, yeah. unless you it's a it's a crazy place. But that, back then, it was a great place still. 2009? I think San Francisco... Um, just like I tell everyone that they should live in New York for a couple of years, um, if you're in the tech space, if you're in the tech world, you've got to live in San Francisco for a bit. I'm not saying that you've got to be there for you know 10, 20 years. You think but there's an edge? Still I think that in there, 2019, I think that there's um, a network. I think that there's a, a way of life. I think that there's a way of thinking about things. I think for sure there is. Yeah. So you couldn't have gotten the exit you did. We could have, but from it San Diego? Would, likely would have taken a lot longer. Longer, and I agree. And so God bless. So, so you moved to San y- – y- your wives w- – and the wives story. We were both married, you and we Alex. We were both married. So and what about the other two families? They didn't have to move in New York. They didn't have to move in New York. So, so, uh, so Brad's been – Brad's had it pretty good. And that's probably why he put on like 400 pounds because he, li- he didn't have to travel. No, with customer, he's actually lost a lot of weight. I'm saying but, but during uh, the Sicily uh, and post Sicily No, he was, he was kind of at that weight with – Prior to us. <laughs> but today he's lost how much? 200 pounds? Uh, over 150 for sure. Over 150. So, so you, you, you and Alex commute to – you have your families in Del Mar. Uh, we were living in Carlsbad at the time. You raise a million six. What happens next? Million seven. Million seven. Because we're happens counting next? the hundred from you. <laughs> yeah, the smart hundred. <laughs> so you moved. So we moved. We got an apartment, and uh, Alex and I were living like we were living post-college, and uh, – uh, we were basically up there Monday through Friday and back home for 30s. the weekends. And the way that we thought about it is that when we were up there, we could you know, dedicate our time to work and we really uh, didn't have to come home for dinner and everything was okay. And then on weekends, we could be all family time. Uh, the, the, the fallacy is that um, when you're doing a startup, there are no weekends. I mean, um, crazy. So it was, it, it was a tough time for, for the wives, for sure. Um, both wives had young children. Uh, mm-hmm. When I moved up, my daughter was you six too. months. So, well, yes, but they, were, they had the children yeah. The majority of the time. And you both have two kids. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but, you know, there was family and support, and uh, they understood that what we were doing was to make a better life for all of us, and it worked out. Okay. So, um, and it was great for me because now I have an apartment in San, San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. So there was no complaints from Lindsay Anity. <laughs> so a lot, let's talk about now taking corporate money. So yeah. next round comes, you're doing well. Yeah. I mean, you have a great team. You and yeah. Alex are incredible. Brad's incredible. Fourth partner. Jeremy. So Jeremy is now a customer too. Yeah, CTO. So Jeremy, I mean, you guys are, are legendary. So, so, so tell me what happens next. There, there was a, this was a tricky situation uh, with corporate money. Not uh, everybody we, loved the idea of taking corporate money. Yeah, really. so I mean, we raised money, and um, this is our B round, I suppose. And uh, towards the end of that, um, Salesforce wants to invest as well, and our investors weren't keen on that. Uh, particular because um, they've they'd seen the movie before where Salesforce invests and then fairly quickly after that there's an acquisition and um, you know the viewpoint was that we were building something truly special here and so they want the investors wanted to make sure that we had a long enough timeline to build value into the business um, but we saw a partnership with Salesforce being meaningful in that. Um, they already had a service product, but it was for the enterprise. Did and they already we own Desk.com, that, uh, the domain? Yes. So Mark Benioff, uh, the CEO Wasn't of Salesforce, uh, owns a lot of domains, and Desk.com happened to be one of them. Yeah. So he, in the back of his head, maybe he was thinking. Maybe. Because I remember, because I was an investor in TweetDeck and Buddy Media and like looking at Hootsuite and and everything became enterprise to me. I wasn't investing in enterprise. I invested in yeah. TweetTech because it was enter- yeah. because it was consumer. Right. It made Twitter usable. I invested in Buddy Media because it was consumer. Right. Uh, and meanwhile, Salesforce comes along and is 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 realizes this is the future of enterprise: listening and 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 search. 
I think what made Salesforce interested in us is that we had a very um, easy sales process. So it's basically onboarding, onboarding. yourself. And uh, at the low end, Salesforce customers typically didn't love the product. And it cost didn't Salesforce, Salesforce. Did, did not love Salesforce yeah. um, because it was too complex. You, you need you an integration you partner. Um, and the not sales sales process is expensive because you still have to walk a customer through the journey and uh, show them the value and help them get onboarded. And so it was an expensive proposition at the low end. And so Salesforce was interested in understanding from us how we built a product that could easily onboard customers. Mm -hmm. and and so did they find you? Um, was I it Ryan that, or was it Billy? I think that we were introduced by Mark Suster actually. Oh. Um, okay. And I'm not sure who the introduction went to. It might have gone to Alex Dayon or it might have gone to Ryan. So who Ryan. led the B, which uh, was really a seed plus? So really, <laughs> Bullpen, uh, oh, Bullpen did their first deal who ever as Paul Martino. Oh, guy's a legend. So it was his first deal ever. Um, and it was they before. They were doing like post-seed. They were the first the guys to like yeah, create exactly, this post-seed fund. Exactly. So they Head priced the it. And then True came in and uh, Index came in. Um, Index Ventures, Index. yeah. Who would Index? God, they've had uh, a run. Bernard. I were they good? Know. Were they good to you? Bad memory. <laughs> were they we haven't you? stayed in touch. Okay. Um, but what I a mean, run the, they've the, had. The, the, the run wasn't so long. So we did that investment in November, December of 2010, and we sold in September of 2011. So, so another eight, nine, nine ten months, months later. Yeah. So sales crack comes in. This was interesting. We I don't know what we're allowed to talk about. But so the, the B round was done at what, 16? Sounds right. And the concern from the VCs, not from me, because I'm an angel investor. You know, this is the lesson about angels versus VCs, because uh, I like to consider myself an angel, but I have outside money now, so I am a VC, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever you want to call them, micro VC, or were micro VCs. So I was ecstatic. Right. I mean, you go from four to 16, you're not fighting, uh, you're getting some traction, yeah. and Salesforce coming in, and I'm like, whew, head. <laughs> I'm thinking of the world as like, right. head, <laughs> right. mark that bitch up. And you guys are great founders. You're doing everything right. But the VCs did not, were not thrilled. They weren't thrilled. And they, because they want you to be a home run. Unicorn. Yes. And there's unicorn potential in hindsight. I think so. And so 11 months later, Salesforce comes in. Now, this is the genius of Salesforce. They came in with a number mm -hmm. that was like perfect. On the acquisition side? Yeah. Um, it, That's their skill. I mean, perfect enough that it got the deal done, I guess. Perfect <laughs> because it made you really, I think, great companies, yeah. whether it's YouTube, got off, they get yeah. offers, yeah. and there's that moment. It's yeah. a good enough offer. Yeah. Like when, well, when it was Facebook definitely got offered way ahead of our revenue, right. or, you know, any way that you slice it, you know, trailing 12 months, future year, yes. however you slice it, it was way ahead of any revenue that we had done or potential, and it was really a strategic acquisition where... Uh, they believe that we can infuse some portions of the Salesforce org with some of the things that we had done, mm -hmm. some of the innovation. So we talked about easy onboarding. We had some pricing innovation. We had some product innovation outside of onboarding. So Timing was great. Timing was great. Um, you know, one of the things that we did was offer a freemium product in customer service. Mm -hmm. A lot of people did trials, but we also did free. And so there was a lot of people talking about us. We had a halo effect from kind of that marketing yeah. uh, that we had done. And, um, you know, I think Salesforce really bought into uh, the overall uh, vision that we had, uh, which was, you know, innovate on things other than uh, product for sure, but other other than product as well. Because business, business model innovation really moves the needle much more than just product. So you go to sales. So we agree. You go to Salesforce. Can we say the number? It was 80? Yeah, 80. And was there an earn out too? Uh, there were handcuffs to make it attractive for us to stay for three years. Was there money years. on top of the 80 if you stayed? Uh, I mean, they basically gave us retention bonuses. So retention bonuses, yeah. which worked out pretty good. Which worked out great. So what was the size of Salesforce at the time? 6,500 people. Okay, so it was a big company, but 6,500 we we, today, what are they? We were 39 people, so the integration team was bigger than the, our entire company. Wow. But yet the uh, vision was big because you were now taking over desk.com. So uh, I think a year into it or six months into it, we rebranded as desk.com. Okay. Um, and when you left, how many people were there? probably 35,000 people now. When I left, it was 16,000 people. That was in So it went from six, four years later, still only 16,000? And now they're yeah. what? 
35? Oh, 35,000. Yeah. So they've, uh, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. I could be wrong, but it's close, directionally accurate. And market cap today? <sighs> I don't know. Close to 100, maybe. I was going to say over that. And when they bought you, do you remember what the market maybe? cap was? Um, in the 30s. So you did well just holding the stock. And obviously, maybe we should, we could, should have just kept buying it. I think so. And do so you own any when, sales when, we, today? Uh, when we sold someone on the core of dev team, I won't name him, but uh, he told me that traditionally Salesforce stock doubles every three years. Well, Ryan. And that's. <laughs> Ryan's made a fortune. He, like, he's and like that's the Costanza actually happened of ever since, too. So uh, he was right then. I need to and, have him uh, on the podcast. Right now. Ryan's a legend. Yeah. So Ryan was, was doing Corp Dev. He's now running the Microsoft account. He's, he's running big accounts. He's running big Microsoft accounts. Now. And he's been there, what, 12 years? He's done Amazon. Young he's done Slack. He's done everything. Quip. Legend. Yeah. There's some quiet killers out there in the For valley. For sure. So he did this deal. He did this deal. Yeah. And so I remember Ryan calling me after this deal and go, who the fuck? Like, he took me out to lunch. He goes, this is enough. <laughs> I got to meet the guy who we bought four of companies in yeah. your stupid ass portfolio. Yeah. So we become good friends. It was a good run for a, you. What, six months? It was, it was a great was run. Fun. They bought four companies. They bought um, Buddy Media for 800 plus million. Coincidence. Uh, that was the first, first yeah. magical, like Mike and Cass, wow. Yeah. But the, I was on the board and, and an angel investor there. They bought... Um, <laughs> Go instant pre pre product. Right, I think it was the highest IRR <laughs> that Tom and I have ever had. Yes, uh, because of, not because of the size of the deal, because it was eleven months from fast, first yeah. investment to acquisition, uh, around one hundred eighty to one hundred million from seed, uh, but in a year. And then I was with Freestyle, and then they bought you. Yep. What was the fourth? I thought there were three. I might be missing one. They invested in Embedly as well, which got bought. So they've done a lot of deals with us. And um, where do you see, we talk about this universe of enterprise. So now, so you, you did well. Now why, your partners all went their separate ways. So let's talk about that. So, the, so you're the Beatles. You've done like 10 companies together. You're investing together. You're doing restaurants together. You guys are inseparable. You st all stayed the same amount of time at Salesforce? Um, I stayed the longest by about six months. I think Alex probably left first, and Brad and Jeremy left together. Okay, so Alex goes on to be CEO, CEO at Campaign Monitor. That's right. So yeah. he stays in the biz. He stays in the biz. His, uh, his thought was that he didn't want to start something from zero again. He wanted to now uh, scale something to the next level. And so he was looking for those opportunities, and Campaign Monitor came along, and he jumped on it. So he's just, he's got it in his bones. What, what made you turn down stuff? Because obviously you could have gone, I remember having these discussions. What at the time made you think, first, I want to be a VC, second, I want to move home, third social leverage like i don't remember, like let's so the, go through the, this because working with me is a nightmare <laughs> so the very start of my career was actually at anderson consulting and i lasted probably less than six months there is alex there too no okay he was at uh dean witter oh dean witter um and uh I lasted less than six months, but the the notion, the reason that I went there is I love the idea of taking knowledge from one company and applying it to another. Because you went to NYU. Quick, short time frame. Yes, I went mm -hmm. to NYU. And um, it didn't work out for me at Anderson Consulting, but I always had that belief. And then when I did angel investing in that three-year period from 2011 to 2014, I probably invested in about 30 companies or so, which is a lot. And is any one that stands out? Gusto. Uh, Gusto is probably so Gusto, the best Gusto, which was Zen, Zen, Zen Payroll Zen at the beginning? Payroll. That's Another right. billion-dollar company. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so a couple, you know, 30, 30 investments, and I loved having the conversation with the founder. I loved understanding their business. I loved helping in any way that I could, and I thought that I'd take learnings from one and apply it to the other, but I had an 80-hour-a-week day job. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was very... Um, uh, reactive, and I really never gave thought to the company after that coffee meeting. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to change that, and I thought that investing full time would be the way to do it. And I spoke to a number of uh, uh, of investors, yourself included. I remember uh, mm -hmm. I had talked to you actually at the Four Seasons in San Francisco on one of your rare trips up there. And I just wanted to get you know a feeling for what it's like to invest day in and day out. And uh, after I had the conversation with you, you said, "Hey, like we should talk about it, partnering." And uh, that was really interesting to me, and we continued that conversation. Ultimately, that's what I wanted to do. Um, Alex, I think, um, 
also loved the investing space, and obviously now he's he's doing that at Redpoint. Um, but he had one more. He wants to take one more swing at at the entrepreneurial bat, and so he did that. Yeah, I warned him against that one. He didn't listen to me. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, not Bre- that it turned out badly. I'm just saying. I gave him the same advice I get, get you. It's the fucking greatest thing to be able to invest in it's at the seed stage. It's the greatest thing to be able so to you're talk happy to incredible decision. founders that are truly trying to change the world, hear their vision, try to understand how you could be helpful to that, um, and really be along for the journey. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, you're happy. It's, I, I'm extraordinarily happy. You always seem happy, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, and let me just put these on for a minute. You got 30 seconds. How, how, how great or bad is it working with me? What does that mean? Oh. <laughs> Let me know when he's done. I'm done. I'm done. All right. <laughs> I thought you did well. The, the But it, it is funny in meetings. Like, so you can tell. But like, wh- ha- give, me, give me a grade. Like, how, how, you guys, so Tom and oh, Gary are always for coaching me before you? we go into a meeting. Oh, I think. Uh, Why do you think it works, what we do? I think it works because we have different perspectives. I think that, uh, you know, you're you're definitely the, the face of the firm and you're out there and you're willing to have an opinion and, and uh, make a statement. Um, I think that Tom is the workhorse on the back end, uh, making sure that all of our investments uh, make sense. Mm. And I think I fit somewhere in between. And, mm. you know, having a perspective and a conversation and being able to um, – push back on each other is really helpful. So, yeah. so far it's been great. I remember telling Tom, because Tom didn't know you as well as I did, right. because I spend most of the time with the companies. Tom's in the back with the accounting hat on going, Howard, stop doing this. Um, <laughs> but Tom and you know, I'm 23rd anniversary yesterday. Tom and I are Congrats. like over 30, thanks, over 30 years yeah. without sex. <laughs> so we're like been married forever. So there's yeah. like no sex, no stress, no nothing. It's just two dudes. And the conversation is just like a, a wife after 23 yeah. years, like a couple sentences and we're out of stuff. To, we, we have nothing <laughs> to say to each other. But they don't end in fights. They're just like, oh, Howard. And I go, oh, Tom. But um, I got to the point because I immediately, once you, once you immediately threw out that you wanted it to do VC, and I'm still doing this as we think about a yep. fourth partner, yep. a fifth partner, and as we're not thinking about scaling, but as we talk to people, and, I, and I'll send you emails about people that I'm talking to, go, this person could fit well totally. with us. Because we try and keep social leverage as a low ego. Maybe I come across sometimes as, as ego, but I think you could vouch that it's really just me being me. No, I think you've said it before that you have strong opinions loosely held, mm-hmm. so... It's great to have an opinion so long as you're open to input and having a conversation around it. That's how and, it's been. And, and that was my problem. I was starting to get nervous. Like, Tom, too much trust, I think. He trusts me impeccably. Uh, or And I got I was starting to get nervous by Fund 2. It was like, oh, man, 33 companies in Fund 1. <laughs> you know, no one's saying no to me. <laughs> right. uh, I'm not medicated to any well. Deal. I'm still CEO of Stock Twitch. Yeah. People are giving me money, and I'm like, fuck, I was so excited that someone right. – uh, like you was ready to do this. Uh, we weren't recruiting a third partner, but for me is like why I like the size and I think we could go bigger, not bigger in dollar amounts, but like find other people that think like us and just want to get shit done um, is I like being told no. I don't want to be told no in my wheelhouse, but I like not just bullying a deal through and having one meeting with the founders and getting that vibe. I think, I think to, to, to grow as a firm, it was like, it's, it's an important thing, which I want to pass on now personally to yeah. other people starting. I mean, firms. when you guys first started, you were really the last check in, you were, you know, filling out a round and now we're leading rounds, right? And when we're leading rounds, we really have to do a lot more diligence. And, you know, people ask me, <coughs> how long does it take to get a deal done? In some cases, it, it is as fast as three to four weeks. In some cases, it's six months of getting to know the founders and really understanding what they're doing. And are they keeping up with their promises? And do we have a good rapport with them? So you have to do that diligence. And do you like that better than just writing a seed check? I like I having uh, less investments and more ownership in them. Yeah, uh, it's I like, really, I love that too. I, yeah. don't, I don't know if I could go back to just, ri- I do it occasionally, write small checks, um, but it's just not the same. Yeah. Because the founder, it's not, they don't want to keep you up to date. Right. 
even if they say they want to keep That's you right. up to date, and there's other people pulling at it. Okay, so uh, what's it like living back in San Diego? It's amazing. There's no living in San Diego and, and doing in San Diego. You no, I mean, the, well, for sure there are in certain professions, but I think for uh, venture capital, there's there's more deals to be found outside of San Diego. How do you decide on your schedule and when, and when to get up and go? Because um, I have my own thing, but how do you do well, it? Well, I basically... You know, I, I started as the San Francisco partner. I mm-hmm. was living up there, and then I moved down. And but we didn't uh, put stress on you. We no, you didn't put that. stress on me, but um, but I made a commitment to myself that I'm going to stay the San Francisco partner. Yeah. And I think it's of, important. Like, you can't just do what you do in San Diego. Yeah, and part of that is um, just staying connected to our existing companies and trying to be helpful to them. Part of that is networking with other VCs, uh, whether they're at the seed stage and co-investors with us or the Series A and B guys. Uh, part of that's finding new opportunities. You, you have to be in the flow. And so I made a commitment that I'm up there a week out of the month at a minimum, uh, going up there tomorrow again. Um, I'll be back there at the end of May as well. Yes, some um, edges you can stay so, with Alex or friends. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've got lots you of friends. It's not a it's not a difficult thing for me to do. It's an easy flight. And uh, I think that it, it adds value to what we do. So I go to New York a week out of the month. I go to so sorry, two weeks sorry, out of the month. sorry. I go to San Francisco a week out of the month. I go to New York probably a week every two months. Yeah, and we'll talk about that. And um, you know, I'm, New York, I'm the opposite of you. I'll yeah. go to I'll go to L.A., San Diego, right. but I'm in New York a week a month. That's, right. that's how we cover yeah. the earth. And how do and you live in the future? The how do you think you live in the future a little bit? Because um, you're a geek. Yeah, I'm a geek. I mean, like, look, I we talk about this all the time. I think uh, I've been li- living the Tesla dream for a long time. Uh-huh. I think that's one way you're for me to. You're still bullish. I'm still bullish. You haven't gotten nervous the last few weeks. Um, I always get nervous, but I think that uh, you know Elon is changing the world in positive ways. I think that um, the infrastructure advantage that he has is not something that the other car manufacturers are even looking at still. They're mm-hmm. still trying to get a car to market that's on par with what he's done. Mm-hmm. And I think that advantage will play out over time. And how do you do it with, how do you experiment so much with food in your body that way? Um, do you think it's that important? <laughs> I, I find it weird, but so not weird <laughs> like you're weird, like weird <laughs> like I can't, the, how do you break the habit so fast and go from like, Meat to soilant, then to vegetarian. Where are, what are you now? I'm mostly vegan. And, and vegan uh, means no egg, no cheese? It means no meat, no fish, no dairy. You look yeah. good. Do you feel good? I feel great. I feel great. I feel like there's, I have more. Well, so there's two things. So vegan and then uh, intermittent fasting. So I try to skip breakfast. Both? Yeah. Okay. Intermittent, I do the intermittent yeah. too. And but so this whole, like, you're not doing the two day, like, Mac No, I'm, I don't do I'm that. I'm a little nervous about that stuff. Yeah, I don't do that. So I skip breakfast, which is easy enough to do. Totally. And uh, I don't miss it, and I feel like I have more energy. And same thing with uh, with uh, vegan. You know, I never thought that I would be a vegan. Like, I love meat. Meat's awesome. Um, and Jeremy from Customer uh, told me about a documentary that he had seen that got him which to one? stop eating meat. And I said, I said, don't tell me what it's called. I don't want to see it. And then I ended up watching it on Netflix on my own without realizing. What was I said, it called again? What was it called? He said Cowspiracy. So Cal? if you Cow. Cow like conspiracy, but Cowspiracy. Yeah, and, I, love, um, I just had a steak last night. I love steak. Yeah, like look, I'll I'll have the occasional steak too, but I'd say that ninety five percent of my meals are vegan. So hmm. Okay. And, and and this whole I I, wh- I was right about soil. It's fucking stupid. Is soil mean, still I, a thing? I, I, I don't know. You, I hear about it much less. It. I know. It's still, well, so I think that's I part of you being a risk taker. <laughs> so you wouldn't drink I tried it, it out. I tried you it try out. everything out. Yeah. So, so you live in the future. I, I, let's talk about worst, worst investment, one that like kind of shook you. Is there anything that By the like way, shook you? By the way, can we talk about the vegan thing for so, one more sec? Yeah. Living in the future? So beyond me. Sure. Have you seen the stock? Uh, do you own it? I just bought it today. Because uh, this, this is about me living in the future and the conversation it's that gross. we just had. But why would you but eat a burger? Future. Just go have a fucking cucumber. It's not gross. It tastes incredible. It's so good. Why not so just a cucumber on the Barbie? Why do you got to put like... it's not the same thing. <laughs> I don't get it. It's a scam. You're living, some of the shit that you do is uh, you're part of the scam. It's like a cult. But it's the future just too. Just, just, okay, just, but just, I'm allowed to make fun of the future. Yeah, okay. listen, you're making money. There's a million ways to skin a cat. You're a better <laughs> totally. investor than me, I think. Like, I, I it's unbelievable the, 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 the risks that you're willing to take. And I always try and talk you down. Yeah. Like, I talk a big game, but I'm very conservative. So, um, so we've covered a lot. But uh, is, does San Diego have – let's be honest with each other. Yeah. Because like, I don't I, – yeah. I, I love San Diego. Yeah. 
I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Like, here's what I feel has to happen. Then you tell me. For the tech scene? For or any scene. For any it's, scene. It's, like okay. a, it's the greatest city that's not a great city. The airport's phenomenal. Yep. I don't jive where you live. Del Mar is beautiful. Yeah. I didn't jive where you live before inland. Right. If you're gonna, if you're living in California and not on the ocean, fucking okay. move to Arizona. All right. Pay less taxes. I'm with you. But you're on the ocean. It's spectacular yeah. for biking and hiking. I've been there. I love it. Uh, I think La Jolla is a joke just because of the traffic. What? What are Google? Why have the big companies not moved down to San Diego and turned it into? a rewards place for hard work in Silicon Valley. What is San Diego missing to get over the hump? Why is it not booming? I mean, I think some have. Amazon's there now. Apple just moved there. 1,200 people per... uh, Inland. Apple. I don't actually know the the locations, but I I know that they've got... Yeah, I mean, that was a a jab at Qualcomm. So Mm -hmm. it's uh, the chip-making facilities. Got it. Um, But, uh, you know, I think that there are... There are some inroads to that, but the the reality is that San Diego still has a high cost of living too. So if you're going to build a second HQ or you're going to build something else, but those companies can afford it. Maybe, and it's for their employees. Like here's what I said. Like so, little Italy, where I've like yeah. not speculated, but yeah. told everybody else to speculate. Right. And I've made people a yeah. lot of money, uh, and I should do it myself, but I don't like real estate or yeah. carrying costs. You do. How come you haven't speculated there? Because um, you like real I might estate still. There's still time. Yeah, I, I agree. People go, oh, yeah. it's gone up too much. I, I've never, it's like yeah. not bad Brooklyn yeah. with good weather. Like Brooklyn it's just seems weather. lost. Yeah. So so I, I believe that Facebook, if you're listening, Facebook, Google, uh, any of these big companies, whatever it is, should go into Little Italy, take over a couple buildings, and just turn that into a rewards place for your best engineers. Like, I'm an engineer. If we can offer you to move down to San Diego, those are the companies that can afford it. I agree. Cost of living is high. But come on. Cost of living in Silicon Valley is high. For sure. And so is San Francisco. So I don't know if the city's sleeping. I mean, we're not really involved in the city, but San Diego is one giant opportunity. It is. Uh, It's it's also (coughs) so spread out. There's uh, there's things going on in the city, but you know everywhere from Carlsbad to to Little Italy, and it's uh, there's not enough in any one place to be that mecca. Mm-hmm. And I think that's uh, you're right that if a couple of large organizations had some offices in the same area, that would probably make a meaningful difference. Yeah, the airport's phenomenal, and we have Manscaped Whiff. We do. In and so let's let's talk quickly Carmel about Valley that. now. Yeah, it's Carmel Valley. So where's Carmel Valley? Just south of Del Mar. So what do we what do we like about Paul? So Paul is he's a he's a hustler. He's an entrepreneur. He's a go getter. He's yeah, uh, he's, he's spent more time with them than me. Yeah, he's a guy that's just going to figure stuff out. And yeah. um, I mean, you had known him before I knew him. You introduced me to him um, when Jason and Paul got together. But uh, you know, he's probably had six or seven businesses and uh, that that he talks about. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, you could just see that there's a fire in his belly and he's going to do whatever it takes to succeed. And so, yeah, so he's got basically two startups going in one. Yeah, sister companies. I'd so like to WIF say. that we're an investor in and also Manscaped. That's right. And Manscaped took off. It has. And so I remember we gave him advice to like Manscaped wasn't big enough. Do you remember... And so what did we learn from that? Yeah, I mean, I think he actually came to this too, which is why he was doing WIF. He thought that Manscaped initially was going to be, it's a brand play. If you get enough of that halo effect, you're going to sell a lot of uh, goods through e-commerce. But there was no real software aspect to it. And so with WIF, what he wanted to create was an opportunity where he would really get to know the consumer, get to know the tastes, understand kind of their, their habits, and through that, be able to sell them more product, yes. uh, scented products in, in the case of WIF. Yes. And, and then let's talk about uh, one of your great investments for our fund, customer.com. Yeah. Let's, Love those can guys. we pull up the site quickly? We'll end with this. Because this is really the future. I mean, this, you and I agree on one thing. Yeah. Well, Jeff Bezos, obviously, the customer is everything. Yeah. And so tell me how this came. So Sicily was like your, you had e-assist. Yeah. IPO, blah, 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 99 bubble. I'm not going to go there. Then you do a Sisley. Well, first we had eShare. eShare. Then eAssist. eAssist. Then a Sisley. A then lot a of E's and assists. So a lot of assist business. Yeah. What made you come back at it again? 
Well, it wasn't me. It was my two co-founders and lots of the you other companies. You knew they were up to something. I knew that they were up to something, and certainly we spent lots of times talking about what they should do. But you know, they've been in the space for now twenty years, customer service and support, and they know it intimately. Um, the the thing that you get by investing in guys like that is that there's no real product development, the product marketing. Why? Fit because they know what that needs to be built. They've been in that space and and they're entrepreneurs. So it's mm. not someone from a large organization that knows the space but doesn't know how to get it built. Mm-hmm. It's guys who have built it before and have seen the changing dynamics and now appreciate what needs to happen. So I, I'd say there's two core innovations that these guys have done. One is um, at Assistly we built a beautiful application that anyone can get up and running it, for a low price. For low price. Yep. Um, but at some level of scale, there's a business maturity aspect where you need a platform. You need to be able to extend the business processes that you're doing. And we didn't you have enough You can't just be a that. product. You can't just be a product. You can't just be an and application. Think you knew that at Assistly, maybe? We learned it at Assistly when we were acquired by Salesforce. Oh, Salesforce so is like, a platform. That's not right? why you sold it. That's not why we sold it. Okay. But what we saw is that our best customers eventually, their upgrade path was to go to Service Cloud. Right, the Salesforce so product, which is a platform. It was a good acquisition for Salesforce. It was in a great. Sense uh, they yeah, knew I think what I, they were getting. I think I think it was a good acquisition for Salesforce yeah. for sure. Okay. Um, so um, at a, at customer, the notion was we're going to build a beautiful application, but it's on top of an extensible platform. So that platform is what gets companies like Ring excited. So mm-hmm. Ring has you know thousands of agents now using the product, and they're ecstatic because they integrate into every piece of their workflow. And so, you know, if you buy uh, the Ring doorbell, the customer service agent knows which doorbell you have right in, in front of them in that screen, in that customer timeline. Mm-hmm. And uh, that makes that interaction, that process of servicing you as a customer that much better. And the second thing that they did was they changed uh, the paradigm. So in traditional customer service, it's all about uh, tickets and cases. And they said, forget about that. It's all about the customer. We just have a customer timeline. There's no tickets or that cases. Was the, that was the hack. Those the two innovation. things together, I think, I are remember. the big innovation. Yeah. And the fact that they've had two decades of each of experience in the space gave them the ability to build the platform from day one the right way. Mm-hmm. And the company has now raised how much? We were seed. Um, you were seed. You led the seed. Uh, we re- led the seed. That was about three million bucks. With, then with, another ten. Another then another thirty-five. Yeah, so twenty-eight. They raised now close to a hundred. Yeah, so they raised close maybe, to hundred. This 70. is in four years. Uh, we invested in probably twenty sixteen. So less than four years. Yeah. So domain experience. I can't say this enough. Yep. You and I both know this. Main yep. financial services. Yep. You and enterprise and mainly customer support. Yeah. Is like. It's hard to put, you got to put the band back together. You got to have experience. In 2019, I think just attacking. Yeah. Unless you are a Gen Z and inventing something yeah. new. If you're attacking an incumbent without domain experience, it's I think tough. it's tough. I think the other thing that these guys have done, which is um, and the, not who always. they're attacking? Zendesk, let's say? I think Zendesk in the short term, for sure. I think over time, you get into the bigger players, which is obviously so. Salesforce. Um, but they're not there anytime soon. Uh, Zendesk is uh, now what a nine billion dollar company. Yeah, let's um, talk about this quickly. What do we see? The un- there's planets now within planets. So there's Google, Tencent, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, yeah. and then there's enterprise planets. How, let's, how do you think about them? I know how I think of them. Do you agree? Like, is there like planets now within enterprise? Uh, meaning. Just companies, companies that, that are ecosystems themselves. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, you know, you you've always had Microsoft and you've had Oracle, although more traditional and old school. And Salesforce. I mean, if you go to any of their Dreamforce events, you realize how many businesses have been built on top of that one company. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they're 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 solar systems, right? They yeah. have a gravitational pull. They um, it, it makes sense to build into those ecosystems. And who's some of the new, like, would you c- Workday, HubSpot? Uh, sure, uh, Coupa. I mean, there's lots of Coupa. there's lots of uh, companies that. Do you are, own some Coupa? I don't. I've been watching I it. Don't. It's so it, that's a great company. Yeah, it's like not too many people have heard of it. Stock's done yeah. amazing, but not too many people. I have mean, heard. you know, Gusto on the on the uh, payroll, payroll and but there's a lot sides. of people. Yeah, I mean, they're attacking the ADP Paychex, market. ADP. Paychecks, yeah. 
Yeah. So what slows down enterprise? Like, wh- like you, you've been investing in enterprise now yeah. for forever. Is there like something that people don't see? Like <coughs> the stocks are trading at crazy valuation. Uh, I think or do you that's, not agree? No, I think that they should be trading at crazy valuations because you're looking at future cash flows and the future is written into what they're doing today. They could stop work and you know the future is kind of written for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they're not going to and they're going to continue to innovate. Um, but... Uh, you know, from an investing standpoint, at least where we sit, um, I think entrepreneurs need, need to think about the big picture and actually build platforms and core products and not features. And I how see. do they do that? Do they have to have been in the industry to know how to build a platform? Do they? Can you found a company just as a visionary, or do you have to know how to be a developer? Do you have to be? You have to have a co-founder who, who who can build. I mean, we invest in technology companies, software companies, so I think it's hard not to have that core software expertise on your team. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think. Some people have been successful in outsourcing that, but yeah. it's just very, very rare. And how, how so we're biased against it. Yep. Yeah. How should people pitch you that are listening? Um, I mean, the, the, the most effective way is to find an entrepreneur that I've worked with before that can uh, present you to me. Uh, that's the most effective way. But uh, obviously, I, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. There's other ways to find me. And what are you focused on? What, what excites you for Fund 3 and beyond? So I'm still on the enterprise side. That's what gets me jazzed uh, But you help the most. me out. I and, certainly and you help you out. Invest, yeah, so we, we, we do all kinds of things. But, um, but enterprise. But most recently, I've done a couple of healthcare companies. that mm-hmm. I would still call them enterprise, but with a healthcare focus. Mm-hmm. And so I think that market is uh, unbelievable unbelievably ready for change, yeah. uh, especially in the U.S. And so there's lots of opportunities that I'm sure we're going to continue to see. And um, how old are your kids? Uh, nine and six. Do you think that will help with your investing? Or I think I've got another couple of years uh, for their before they're helpful you the, way, the way that you talked about raising they millennials. What are that, that we didn't use? Is uh, it voice? What's the thing? Um, they're just so much better and faster at picking up anything tech-related. I mean, they're using iPads, Macs, uh, the Google Echo, uh, Show, sorry, Amazon Show. Amazon Show, what's that? Uh, it's basically their uh, Dot and Echo device, but it's with a visual display, so you could watch videos on it, and you could actually do phone they like calls vid- visually. Um, they love it. They love it. So Amazon's probably your biggest, you love Amazon. My biggest. Position? It's it's edging up with Tesla. <laughs> and so Tesla, you've yeah. written this down, and you're not scared yet. The uh, So against my advice. But Amazon, <laughs> I'm with you. Um, do you own any enterprise stocks? Um, I uh, have some Zoom. Smart. Um, and, I mean, depending on how you look at it, Google, Amazon. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. enterprise. Yeah. Okay, so you, you best to reach an entrepreneur that may know you. Be yeah. creative to get in touch with us. Don't just send us a cold email. I mean, you can. It's easy you to can, find us. Yeah. Just because we have we share our emails doesn't mean you should send us a cold email. Yeah. Um, but no law against it. Um, I mean, the best way to, to show healthcare. that you could sell is to find someone, sell to them, and find that person that knows us. I mean, there's lots I of – I agree. Th- our connections are not small. I agree. And um, healthcare and enterprise. Yeah. All right, buddy. That was fun. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Okay.